Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two or more player game, Star Wars Unlimited, published by Fantasy Flight Games, who helped sponsor this video. Prepare to visit a galaxy far, far away in this trading card game where opponents battle using custom-built decks. In case you're not familiar, a trading card game is one where you typically purchase individual packs containing a random assortment of cards that come from a larger fixed set that, following a few rules, can be combined into a unique personal deck. You then use the deck you created to battle other players and see who will claim victory. And this will often lead to discovering ideas about how to customize your deck further with other cards in your collection or by trading with friends for new cards you'd each like. Along with head-to-head -head matchups, Star Wars Unlimited has rules for games with more than two players and formats like drafting and tournament play. But here, I'll teach you everything you need to know to use this Spark of Rebellion two-player starter set, which has everything two players need to get started. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To start, let's take a look at the contents of this set, which include two fully playable decks, one for each player, what are known as token cards, boxes to store each deck, and a variety of counters you'll use during the game, along with two playmats. When unfolded, these create a play area which include helpful reminders of common rules, often useful for new players. Separately, you can also pick up officially licensed GameGenic products like this neoprene mat I'll be using during this video instead. I'll also be using their premium acrylic tokens in place of the cardboard ones, which include some additional markers. You can also separately pick up stylized card sleeves and deck boxes to further protect and store your collection. Keep in mind, these are optional extras. Everything you need to begin playing comes in the starter set, but these upgrades can be nice enhancements. All right, to play, each person needs a deck. And as I mentioned, this set comes with two ready to use right out of the box. A deck always contains your leader, a single card with the leader and unit keyword located here in its top left-hand corner. In this set, one player will have Luke Skywalker as their leader, and the other will control Darth Vader. Leaders are double-sided, and you'll find they have just the leader keyword when flipped over, which we also see here with Darth Vader. Your deck also always has a single base labeled here. This one is for Luke's deck, and Darth Vader uses this one. Finally, each player has a deck of 50 cards built especially for this starter set, so you don't have to make any adjustments before playing. That said, you can customize them as you collect new cards, often found in booster packs like this. The two decks come separately wrapped in the box, but if you accidentally mix them, you'll find the contents of each player's deck written on the back of their base, so you can rebuild them using the names on each card found easily at the top here. With that understood, let's learn how to set up our first game. To begin, set up the included playmats so they're between the players like this, with each person seated on either side. In this video, I'll be using this playmat instead, but it works the same. Nearby, set the included initiative, epic action, and damage tokens. I'll be using the premium tokens, but they also work the same way. Also find the starter set's six double-sided token cards labeled as token upgrades in their corner here. These you also keep in a supply nearby as they'll be shared by both players. Each player now takes one of the included decks to use, Darth Vader's or Luke Skywalker's, and sets their base on the indicated spot facing their opponents. They then set their leader below their base with the horizontal side face up. Now randomly pick a player to collect the set aside initiative token, which they'll put into an area beside themselves. Each player also shuffles their deck and sets it face down nearby. From their deck, each player draws six cards to form their opening hand. You can always look at your own cards, but keep them a secret from the other player. After this initial draw, the player with the initiative token now decides if they want to mulligan. If they do, this means they'll shuffle their entire hand back into their deck and then draw a new hand of six cards. But a player must keep anything they drew after a mulligan. Then their opponent decides if they want to mulligan. A mulligan can be a good idea if you don't like your opening hand, and for new players, it's especially recommended that you do this if your hand doesn't contain any units with a cost of one or two. Units are cards with this label in their top left-hand corner, and a card's cost is also located in the top left within a yellow box. After each player has had a chance to mulligan, they must then each pick exactly two cards from their hand 
to turn into resources. To do this, they lay their chosen cards face down into a personal resource area, which is marked on the mat here. And that's the setup. In Star Wars Unlimited, players will spend resources to put units into play and execute abilities in order to reduce their opponent's base to zero health and win the game. The game is played over a series of rounds, broken into two phases each, starting with the action phase. In the action phase, beginning with the person holding the initiative token and going back and forth, players perform one action each. So on my turn, I take one action, then my opponent takes one, then I take one. And we continue like this back and forth until we both pass. Now there are five different types of actions to choose from, so let's go through each, starting with playing a card. To do this, pick one in your hand and pay its cost. We saw earlier this is shown in its top left-hand corner with a yellow background. This represents the number of resources you must exhaust to play it. Your resources, like many cards in the game, will either be upright, meaning they're ready to use, or exhausted, which is shown by turning them sideways. To pay the cost of a card, you exhaust that many ready resources that you have. If you don't have enough, then you can't play that card. Now I should warn you, during this video, I'll be putting various cards into play to create different examples, whether I have the required resources or not. But when you're playing, you must pay the required costs. Your deck will be made up of three main types of cards you can play as labeled in their top left corners. You'll have units, events, and upgrades. Let's start by seeing how you play units. Units are broken into two types, shown in their top right corners, known as ground and space. On either side of their bases and leaders, as we see labeled on our play mat, each player has a space units arena, as well as a ground units arena. When you pay the cost to play a space unit, set it into your space arena, putting ground units into your ground arena. Also, anytime you play a unit, it comes into play exhausted. I'll just say that again for emphasis. When you first play a unit, it comes into play exhausted. And we'll see the impact of units being ready or exhausted a little later. For now, I'll just quickly point out that each unit will have a power value, shown with a red background here, as well as a number of hit points, also referred to as HP, shown here with a blue background. When a unit comes into play, it will stay in play until something causes it to be removed. Often this will be caused by gaining an amount of damage tokens equal to its HP value, but we'll discuss that in more detail later. I should mention many cards have abilities printed in this area. Some, like this one, are known as a triggered ability. Its trigger will be shown in bold. For example, this effect resolves as soon as this card is played. Here we're told to either ready a resource or exhaust a unit. Unless the ability's effect includes the word may, then you must resolve it when triggered, if possible. Notice this when played ability instructs you to search the top five cards of your deck for up to two imperial cards. The term imperial is written in bold and italicized. This means it's referring to a trait, and cards can have one or more traits. On units, they'll be listed in this area. For example, this card has both the imperial and official trait, while this unit has both the rebel and droid trait. If you have an event like this one, then its traits are listed in this area. Upgrade cards, like the one we see here, will show its traits in this area. We won't go through every ability in this video, as how they work is printed on them, and they'll make more sense as we learn more of the rules. But I should point out that some units have this unique card symbol beside their name. You can have more than one of these in your deck, but you may never have more than one under your control at the same time. In other words, we can't have two C-3PO units under our control at once. Well, not exactly. If we had one already in play, and then played a second, we now have two under our control at once, and that means I have to now choose one of them to defeat. So you can play a second copy, you're just forced to defeat one of them immediately afterwards. And I'd probably choose this one as it already has damage, and this one doesn't. And don't forget we can still resolve the when played ability on the copy we just brought in. Just be aware you can have more than one unique card under your control at the same time, even if they share the same name, as long as they have one or more printed attributes that are different. For example, these two Leias share the same name, but have several other differences. 
That said, even if just their subtitles were different, which they are in this case, that would be enough of a difference to allow you to have both of these in play under your control at the same time, and one of them wouldn't automatically be defeated. Okay, with that, we've learned quite a bit about playing units, so now let's take a look and see how playing an event works. After paying its cost, you resolve its ability, shown in the area here. You then place it face up into your personal discard pile beside your deck. Unlike units, these aren't added to your play area. This brings us to the last type of card, an upgrade. After paying its cost, shown here, you then attach it to one of the units you already have in play, whether that unit is ready or exhausted. To do this, you slide the upgrade underneath, so only its bottom portion is showing. Most often, an upgrade will provide increased power, or in this case, increased HP or hit points, to the unit it's attached to. That means, in this case, the rogue operative's total HP is now 4 plus 3, or 7. There's no limit to how many upgrades can be assigned to a single unit, but be aware, sometimes there may be restrictions. For example, Luke's lightsaber can only attach to a non-vehicle unit. Vehicle is a trait, and since this unit doesn't have that trait, it means it's a non-vehicle unit, and this can be attached to it. Now, since this upgrade also provides an ability, you'll want to ensure that remains visible as well. With that, we've covered the play a card action, so let's look at a different action you can take on your turn instead, called using an action ability. These are abilities that start with the bolded word action in front of them, like we see here. Unlike the when played ability we saw earlier, these don't automatically resolve at a certain time. Instead, you have to use your action for the turn to perform them. Many actions also have a cost showing inside brackets immediately to the right. In this case, we see an arrow icon, which means you must exhaust the card. So if we had this card already in play from a previous action, and if it was ready, we could exhaust it to resolve the action here. Since exhausting is part of this action's cost, we won't be able to use this action again since we can't exhaust something that's already exhausted. We'd have to wait until it's ready to use this action again, and we'll see how units can be readied a little later. Here's another example of an action ability right on our Luke Skywalker leader. And your leader begins in play, and that means we can also resolve its ability. Just notice its cost shows that you have to pay a single resource and exhaust this card as well to resolve the effect. So we'd exhaust a resource and this leader to use its ability. This says it gives a shield token to a unit you played this phase that has what is known as the heroism aspect. Most cards in your deck have an aspect, represented by one or more symbols usually found in this area, and there are six different types. Heroism, Vigilance, Command, Aggression, Cunning, and Villainy. So Luke's ability is saying that if we had played a card with the Heroism aspect at any time during this phase, in other words, during any of my previous actions during this action phase, I can use this action to give a shield token to it. Tokens are a special type of card separate from a player's deck, and we take these from the supply anytime we need them. They're double-sided and have an experience and a shield side, and both represent upgrades. When an effect gives a shield to a unit, we flip the token to this side and attach it just like we would any other upgrade. If an effect would instead provide experience tokens, like we see here, flip the token to this other side and attach it that way. I should point out, leaders also have a special epic action they can perform, but we'll come back and discuss those later. For now, let's move on to another action you can instead take on your turn, attacking with a unit. And to explain this again, I'll be setting up various examples like you might see later on in a game, just to help illustrate. To attack, you must pick a ready unit you already have in play to exhaust, and then you pick a target, which can be either your opponent's base or a single enemy unit in the same arena. In other words, a ground unit here can't target a space unit here. But units in either arena can target the opponent's base. Let's assume I target the opponent's base with this attack. I look at the attacking unit's total power, which includes any attachments, so four in this case, and then I deal that as damage to the opponent's base. And any time damage is dealt, that value in damage markers is placed on the target. Let's say we had instead chosen to target an enemy unit with our attack action. The target can be ready or exhausted. 
but you can only pick a single target, and the target doesn't change its state. If it was ready, it stays ready. If it was exhausted, it stays exhausted. For this example, we'll target the Viper probe droid, and I'll just turn it around to face you. This unit is known as the attacker, and the target is known as the defender. And both of these units now deal damage to each other simultaneously based on their related power. And this is true even if we had targeted an exhausted unit. It would still deal its power in damage back to the attacker. In this case, though, our attacker has a total power of four. Remember to include any upgraded power you're gaining. So we deal four points of damage to the probe droid. It has a power of three, so it deals three damage back. After damage is dealt, if any unit has damage equal to or greater than its total HP, it is immediately defeated. So in this case, the droid is defeated, and any extra damage it was dealt is ignored. Defeated units and any upgrades attached to them are returned to their owner's discard pile, and you can put any of the damage tokens that were on them back into the supply. Now that's a very basic example of an attack, but things can change based on the abilities units might have, so let's look at a couple other examples. If your unit has a shield token attached, then if it's dealt damage, as it says here, all of that damage is ignored, and you defeat or discard the shield token instead. So going back to the previous example, if a shield token had been on the droid when the attack was resolved, then when the security force deals four damage to this droid, all of that damage would be prevented and the shield would just be removed. The droid would still deal its damage back, but more importantly for this player, the Viper droid would stay in play. With the shield gone, it will take damage as normal next time. But just remember, a unit could have more than one shield. And if so, then the first time it takes damage, one of the shields would be removed, and it would still have another to protect it the next time it would take damage. Here's another ability to be aware of, Sentinel. When attacking an arena that contains a Sentinel unit, you must target that unit instead of the opponent's base or other units in that arena. So if I had just exhausted this unit to attack with it, the Sentinel here means that I can't target the opponent's base or this Viper droid. I have to target the cell block guard. And this is true even if this unit is exhausted. Its related effect is still active. If there was more than one Sentinel in play, I could pick either one of them to be the target of my attack. The effects of a Sentinel unit can be ignored if you're attacking with a unit, like this one, which has the Saboteur ability. Not only does this allow you to ignore Sentinel units and pick any target as normal, but the target you pick also loses any shields attached to it before you deal your damage. Some units have a raid ability which will show a value. This is a bonus the unit gets to its power, but only when it's attacking. For example, if I attacked with this rogue operative, its raid two value combines with its power for a total of four damage when it attacks. But let's say instead this player was initiating the attack. In that case, when the rogue operative hits back, because it wasn't the attacker, it will only hit with its normal power of two. If a unit has a restore ability, it will also show a value. And when this unit attacks, it heals that much damage from your base. So if I attacked with this vehicle, I'd remove one damage from my base and return it to the supply. If a unit has an on attack ability, this resolves any time that unit attacks. In this case, it would exhaust an enemy vehicle ground unit. Some cards have a when defeated trigger, like we see here. So if this super laser technician was defeated, this effect would resolve, but notice this ability has a may qualifier. That means you don't have to resolve this effect if you don't want to, where normally triggered effects have to be resolved when their trigger occurs. With that, we've covered the attack with a unit action. You pick one of your ready units, exhaust it, and target either your opponent's base or a single one of their units, and then deal damage as required, resolving any other special abilities that would trigger. For your first games, I'd recommend turning to this page of the rulebook, as it will walk you through the exact order various abilities resolve during an attack if you're ever uncertain. Also, if you're using the starter kit playmats, you'll find handy reminders of various abilities and keywords found on cards if you need additional reminders. Next, let's learn another action you can instead perform on your turn, taking the initiative. Only one person can take this action each round, and when they do, 
they take control of the initiative marker from wherever it is, even if they currently have it. When you take the initiative token, again, whether you're taking it from your opponent or when you already had it, flip the token face down to show it's been taken. After taking the initiative, you can't perform any more actions for the rest of the action phase, and the other player will just continue taking actions one after the other. So that leaves us with one last action to explain, passing. If you can't or don't want to take an action on your turn, you may pass. You do nothing for your turn, and your opponent immediately takes their next action. However, after their action, the next action still comes back to you, and you can pass again or do something else. So passing is a way to stay in the phase, but delay doing an action. However, if you pass, and then your opponent for their very next action passes or takes the initiative, the action phase just ends. And that covers the action phase. To begin, the player with the initiative takes a single action, then their opponent does, and back and forth you go until both players have passed back to back, or one player has passed when the other has used the take the initiative action. Either way, it's then time for the regroup phase of the round. Here, each player draws two cards from their deck into their hand. Then the player who currently has the initiative marker decides if they want to pick any one card from their hand to put face down as a new resource. After they decide, the next player may also turn a card from their hand into a resource if they want. Then all of the cards are readied, and this includes all of the units, all of the leaders, and all of the resources. And you'll notice any damage in play carries over into the next round. Then the action phase of the next round begins, starting with the player currently holding the initiative token, which they should ensure is now face up. I should mention, if no player used the take the initiative action in the previous round, and instead the round ended because both players just passed back to back, then whoever had the initiative token keeps it. With that, we've covered many of the rules, but there's a very special action you can take on your turn during the action phase referred to as an epic action. Each leader has one of these on their horizontal side, and this can only be performed once per game. After that, you can't perform it again. Now, as it says here, you may perform this action on Luke Skywalker once you control six or more resources. In this example, I only have five, but as soon as I have six or more resources, I'm then allowed to use my epic action. You'll notice with Darth Vader, you need at least seven resources before you can perform his epic action. But either way, once you're eligible to perform it and decide to, you now flip your leader to its leader unit side as shown here. You then move it to your ground arena since it's a ground leader unit. But unlike other units, it doesn't enter the arena exhausted, it comes in ready. And this is true even if that leader had been exhausted before you performed its epic action. The epic action doesn't have an exhaust cost, so you can perform it when it's exhausted, and then it comes into play ready and on its other side. And just to be clear, you don't exhaust any resources to perform your epic action. They just have to be in your resources area whether they're exhausted or not. Once this side of your leader is in play, it can attack, be attacked, and perform its abilities like any other unit. And you'll notice it has both the leader and unit types here. This also means effects that target a unit can target your leader. Darth Vader's ability says that when he attacks, he first deals two damage to any one unit. This is resolved separately and before he deals damage from his five power here. We know that when a unit attacks, it must target another unit in its own arena, but that only applies to where the damage from its power value is assigned. Damage dealt by an ability like this doesn't have that restriction. So Darth Vader could target this ground unit for his attack, but first assign the two damage from this ability to the space unit here, which would actually defeat it, and then assign the five damage from his power to the ground unit he targeted, and of course, that unit would deal its damage back as normal. Getting your leader into the arena can often swing the tide of battle in your favor, so you'll want to perform that epic action at the right time. That said, leader units are defeated just like any other unit once they take damage equal to their HP. 
First remove all of the damage from the defeated leader, then flip and return it to its leader space in the exhausted position, even if it hadn't been exhausted before it was defeated. It will ready again during the regroup phase and you'll be able to use it as before, but its epic action can't be used again during this game. So place one of these tokens here as a reminder. Okay, with that, we've almost covered everything to get you started with this set. But I should mention, although it's unlikely to happen with these decks, it is possible you might play a game in the future where you run out of cards when you need to draw more. When this happens, draw as many as you can, and then for every card you need to draw but can't, deal three damage to your base. In this way, if your deck was empty during the regroup phase, instead of drawing two cards, you get nothing and take six damage. Another rule to quickly mention, when you resource a card during the regroup phase, it comes in ready. But if an effect gains you a new resource during the action phase, it comes in exhausted. Okay, with that, you know how to perform the rounds of a game, and they'll continue until a player's base is reduced to zero hit points, making their opponent the winner. If both players' bases somehow reach zero remaining HP at the same time, the game ends in a draw. With that understood, let me quickly summarize the rules for customizing or building your own deck. You must always include exactly one leader and one base and a deck of at least 50 other cards. This leader and base I got out of a pack I just opened. Within a deck, you may have up to three copies of each card, but of course you can include fewer if you like. That said, as long as you follow those restrictions, you can include any other cards you like, though there are penalties and benefits to consider. The leader and base you chose will provide aspect symbols in the areas here which indicate the colors of your deck. You can include cards in your deck from any aspect. And as long as their icons match the ones provided by your leader and base, you can play them as normal during the game. However, if you wish to play a card from your deck that comes from an aspect outside the colors of your deck, you must pay two extra resources beyond its normal cost. For example, if we had this leader and base combination, we can see that each of Chewbacca's aspect symbols are within our deck colors, so we can play him at his normal cost of five. However, if our deck now had Darth Vader as its leader, then we're missing one of Chewbacca's symbols, so we'd have to pay two extra resources to play Chewbacca for a total of seven. If we had Chewbacca in a deck with Darth Vader and this base combination, none of his aspect colors match the colors of our deck, so we'd have to pay two extra for each of his symbols, making it now cost a total of nine resources to play him. And be aware, to avoid the penalty cost, you need to have a separate aspect symbol showing on your leader and or base for each aspect symbol showing on the card you want to play. This card is not found in the starter kit, but it shows two command aspect symbols. With this leader base combination, we only have one of them, so we'd still need to pay two extra resources to play him while he's in this deck. And with that understood, we've covered the rules for deck building. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Star Wars Unlimited using the Spark of Rebellion two-player starter kit. I should mention, games like this can often raise questions about specific card effects and interactions, so for those questions, I'd recommend going to the Star Wars Comprehensive Rules, which I'll link in the description below, and where you'll also find information on the other modes of play, including when you have more than two players. However, if you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get a notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.